Okay, welcome everyone. Really good to see you. It's really great to be back in person, seeing real people without a screen in between. So I'm really enjoyed that. But also, I've been talking so much yesterday that my 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 throat is a little bit sore and my voice is a little bit hurt. So uh, I apologize if that's kind of too much, but it should be okay for the for the session. I'm really excited about this topic uh, because GraphQL is something that I've been working with and, and building integrations for since 2016. So kind of one year or actually six months after uh, Facebook published GraphQL. And then it was actually Rod Johnson who asked me about, hey, can you build a Neo4j integration for GraphQL? And I said, cool, sure, let's try it. And it was really easy to do. And now it's actually become from my experiments part of the product and uh, it, it's really cool. I'm Michael, I've been with Neo4j for a long time, for 12 years now. And uh, I'm a Java champion, so doing a lot of with Java user groups, uh, articles, and so on, lots of conference talks. And I actually started to use uh, GraphQL with Neo4j in 2016 with Kotlin. So because Kotlin is really great for language transformations and streaming uh, processing of data and, 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 and structures. Uh, so it turned out a really good choice for, for building that integration back then. The new integrations are built in JavaScript because they are built uh, inside of the company as part of the uh, user surface uh, JavaScript team. Uh, but it was a really cool experience. So if you ever haven't tried Kotlin yet, I definitely recommend it uh, for uh, things like this. Quick question for you, so I need to look a little bit for the lights. Who of you has used GraphQL APIs? Okay, that's really good. So you know what kind of a GraphQL API look like, looks like. Who has built a GraphQL API? That's more than I expected. Really good. And who has put them also into production as well? One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so I guess that's a good uh, segment for the talk. So I'll do a tiny bit of what is GraphQL, but the majority will be focused on how can we make it easier to build GraphQL APIs, secure them, and also put them out as well. Um, we don't have too much time, uh, so it would be good if you keep questions to the end, and then I'm also around the whole day if you have more questions uh, to, to come around. This is definitely not an REST versus GraphQL talk. You're probably tired of those REST versus GraphQL articles and talks, but I can assure you that this is not one of them, because you make an architectural decision for one API approach versus the other, and there are lots of different uh, reasons why you choose one over the other, so I won't go into this. This is really focus on, on the GraphQL aspect. So GraphQL, I mean, coming from Neo4j as a graph database, many people mix this up, right? Is GraphQL a query language for graph databases, and can I only use it with graph databases? No, it's an API query language, right? So it's a uh, it's it's, it's means to build APIs. Whatever you query with that, if it's a relation database, if it's a REST API, if it's another GraphQL API, if it's a graph database, a document database, it's up to you. It could also be a memory data that you want to expose within GraphQL API. Doesn't matter. GraphQL itself, the, the GraphQL spec, which is kind of led now by the GraphQL Foundation and can be found on GraphQL.org, is really about clean way of building APIs with a lot of thought on developer experience, right? So GraphQL is something where I have to say this was the first time in, in a long time where someone really thought a lot about developer experience, making it as easy uh, as possible to build and use these APIs with a clean spec there's uh, examples, reference implementations, automatic documentation integration in the, in the clients, clients from GraphQL.org uh, or from the GraphQL Foundation. So basically, where REST basically was just in PhD <laughs> thesis of Ray Fielding's, GraphQL is a full ecosystem of tools and everything else focused actually on developer experience, which is really amazing. Um, the main aspect of GraphQL is actually that it defines a type system. So basically, it's similar to your, how you do uh, define your, your object model in, in, in Java, for instance, or in any other language. Basically, you define, or in, in a relation database, you define what are my business types, what attributes do they have, what types do these attributes have, what relationships do my types have. And that's kind of the, the essence of the GraphQL API. This is kind of like the contract between backend and frontend that you agree upon. And then, uh, the whole GraphQL stack from the server to the middleware to the client knows this uh, type definition and can help you uh, with different things, with caching, with validation, with uh, error reporting, with federation pulling different APIs together into one uh, uh, type definition for this, uh, for this endpoint, and uh, for validating your queries, and with type completion and all the things. So the, all the stack knows this kind of type definition, and so it can help you 
have a nicer time uh, doing things. And then you send basically a tree structured query to, to the GraphQL endpoint, basically say, I want to have this root element with these fields and these dependent elements with these fields. And then you can pass in parameters to limit or cursors and, and other things to kind of control how deep what you get back. And then you get a JSON representation back. I'm not really fond of the JSON representation. I would really love if the GraphQL spec would use kind of the really clean semantic checking of the GraphQL type system for the responses as well. But alas, you know, everyone consumes graph, uh, JSON, so it's basically the best that we got. But you can still use the, t uh, the type definition to uh, check this. And then GraphQL, I found it quite interesting. Uh, back then when I talked to the creator of GraphQL, uh, Lee Byron, I asked him, did you ever read uh, um, the, the domain-driven design book? Because many aspects in GraphQL actually feel like taking from domain-driven design. Clear language, clear boundaries, ubiquitous language, type system, uh, dif di uh, difference between object types or entities and value types, kind of command query separation, all these kind of things kind of reminded me a lot of Eric Evans' domain-driven designs, but he had never heard about it. So he Daisy basically built what Facebook needed for their mobile apps, and like with patterns always happens, they ended up at similar concepts, which I found really interesting, as other people building applications uh, in other, other places as well. Uh, so GraphQL defi uh, defines some top-level operations, uh, queries separated from mutations, which are actually always kind of named ways of getting data or named ways of updating data, and then subscriptions for live queries, which give you the, um, the things in detail back. Um, so in principle, uh, or in, in theory, GraphQL APIs are easy to use, true, easy to build, secure, evolve automatically, and are optimized by the middleware. In practice, the easy to use is really true. All the other bits could be much better, right? So there's quite a lot of boilerplate code if you implement GraphQL APIs, writing all the resolvers, taking care of, of security authentication, or authorization filtering yourself, optimizing queries, you have the N plus one select problem with relation to databases, stuff like this. Evolving GraphQL APIs, there's some tooling for evolving the schema, but then how do you kind of deal with the backend that kind of needs to adjust, be adjusted as well? So you have to go back into all your resolvers, update all of them one by one, so it's quite a lot of work. And so when I started to use GraphQL, I thought, hmm, GraphQL looks really nice, clean object model, clean type, clean type system. It actually looks very much with, like the other thing that I'm working with, a graph database, which also has entities relationships, is, has no fixed schema actually, so that's kind of where GraphQL adds an advantage over kind of the graph database that it can, you can if you want to add a schema on top. And so it's a really nice mapping with no impedance mismatch. So, and, and so I thought, okay, let's try to bring the two together and it actually turned out really well and that's what I'm gonna talk about. So these kind of four of the challenges, boilerplate, schema evolution, security optimization, how can we address them? Uh, quick refresher, so I've already talked about this in the, in the type definitions that we have. We have types, we have fields with types. And something that's really cool that they added also to GraphQL, kind of as an afterthought, as just an you know, extension point, because they also didn't know, because they were JavaScript people, and PHP people, because Facebook, right? Um, they didn't know about annotations, that Java had annotations. And I said, did, did you know that your directives that you added to GraphQL is actually very much like annotations for metadata in, in, in Java? And they said, no, we didn't know about that back then when we added them. But it's a really cool extension point because with annotations you can add metadata to the type system, add metadata to, to the query, to the fields, to everything. So, and this metadata can then be used by infrastructure and tools to add, uh, improve the user experience to enhance the APIs and, and stuff like that, which is really cool. So these are the add fields with, with name. And um, for the query, you basically, as I said, you create a tree query, you have an entry point, and then you say, I want to have these fields. I want to have these nested objects. You can pass in parameters to each of, each field actually can take a parameter, and depending on what the parameter is, it can do something with the field. It can return a different format. It can filter it. It can uh, limit it, what, whatever you, you want to do. And, and then you get the tree structure as results back, uh, like this. So from the selections that, it, that you, that it maps one-to-one -to, -one to the response uh, structure of the JSON. So if you look at a query, and squeeze a little bit, then or squint a little bit, then you see the results as well coming in. And being a coming from a front-end development perspective, which I'm not, I'm definitely a back-end developer, which you'll see if you see my front-end UI <laughs> that I built. Um, 
if you have components that have a certain set of data that they need to, to work with the user, you can actually see, okay, I need this field, I need this other field, I need this kind of dependent children with these fields. So basically, whatever you need in your component, you can translate one-to-one -one into GraphQL query, and then you get exactly that back, uh, what you asked for, not more, not less, exactly the things that you asked for, which is really, really cool from a front end and API perspective in general that you don't overfetch or underfetch your data, don't have to do multiple uh, requests. So in, in traditional GraphQL implementations, you would have to implement all these fields for, per type, per field, um, as, as resolvers yourself. So you basically have to say, okay, go to this database, go to the storage, go to this other REST API, fetch the data, return the data. And then, again, for the next fields, go to this other service, catch the data, get the data, return the data. So which is kind of nice for toy applications, but I've, I'm sure you've all been in, in projects where you had not one endpoint, but 500 endpoints with, you know, I don't know, databases with several hundred tables representing the entities, and then you don't want to maintain this kind of stuff. So people, even in the GraphQL ecosystem, started to generate this, these kind of things. There are also a number of companies that actually offer similar uh, approaches to what I'm showing you today for, for relational databases, or Mongo, and, 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 and so on. So it's definitely a, a need. No one wants to maintain this kind of code where you need to go always to, to places and fetch stuff. Right? So you don't overfetch with GraphQL, don't underfetch because you exactly return what you need. If you underfetch in, in REST, you have to more, do more REST API calls to kind of get the remaining data. If you overfetch, you're returning too much data over the wire. Uh, GraphQL specification is really good because it's an evolving document with a clean process. There's a working group. Everyone can participate. Actually, it's open source. Even then, when it back at, was back at Facebook, they made it open and invited people to come in. So we kind of went just to, to the Facebook office, sat down with the working group, discussed things. So it's a very, very inclusive and, and very open um, community as, uh, as well. And it's basically graphs all the way down. I mean, which is really nice for us as a graph database, but actually, if you talk to the people from Apollo or others, they also think about this kind of application graph or domain graph, right? I mean, I, I'm not sure if they should have chosen graph. I mean, I really liked that they chose graph, but they confused a lot of people with this. Uh, but it's basically the application or domain model that goes all the way down. And there's a really nice Apollo uh, article about this as well. And they focused really uh, on, on developer uh, uh, experience and effectivity. And what's really nice as well as part of all this kind of metadata and additional information, the GraphQL community from day one had really cool tools where you have type completion, integrated docs, um, error handling, validation, even if you pass parameters and you don't use the parameters, it complains about that the parameters are, are not used, or it at least gives you the hint that parameters are not used. So there's a lot of really good IDEs for, for GraphQL, GraphQL Playground, Graphical, Apollo Studio, and also we have a new tool which I want to show, which is called Neo4j GraphQL Toolbox, which I actually like because it runs in browse and runs basically both the API endpoint and the, the query tool in your web browser, so you don't need to spin up your Node.js application to serve like the backend API for, for development and testing, but you can basically start doing this in the browser without having to install anything, no node, no, no dependencies, nothing, which is pretty cool. And I already mentioned some of the power features that GraphQL has that we can actually utilize for this. Type system, type system with schema, we have types, we have relationships in there actually, expressed as, as real relationships, not just as an uh, you know, here's an ID of another object somewhere that I can fetch. You have the metadata with directives, which are the extension points, and you can declare your own really com complex directives as well. It's in all layers from the client all the way to the server middleware as well, and there's a ton of tools already by the GraphQL community. If you're working in Java like I do, GraphQL Java is an amazing library. I can just recommend it. Andy and his team are doing amazing work kind of maintaining it, keeping up to date with the spec, integrating it with the modern Java features, it's really a joy to use, and it's, uh, I've been using it since 2016, actually, and it's really, really good. So GraphQL Java is really good. Spring GraphQL also uses GraphQL Java on the hood, and, and so that's really good. And, and the other aspect that, I mean, coming from Neo4j, it's, of course, clear, but what's really nice about using a graph database with graph databases, uh, with GraphQL is there's no impedance mismatch, right? You don't need to say, okay, this object is actually a join table, this object is actually a real table, and I need to kind of implement joins to fetch data or I need to do n plus, n, n, n plus one selects to get this data. So, but I can basically say, look at, my, look at my data, look at my graph query, look at my GraphQL query, look at the type system, and they're kind of 
the same, right? So I can basically move around and I don't lose any fidelity, I don't lose any capabilities there, and, and so I, it makes it so much easier to, to use this stuff. So Neo4j graph database, as a uh, transactional database, has a property graph model. We have our own query language called Cypher, which I actually like much more than SQL because it's more humane than SQL and more expressive and you can do really cool shit. There, I just built Game of Life in Cypher a few days ago, which is really nice to kind of see the evolving generations uh, as such. We have graph analytics in memory compute, lots of visualization tools, and GraphQL integrations, of course. And there is a service. So, um, I want to demo this actually to you, how to, to do it, because I mean, everyone can say it's easy, but if you can't really show that it's easy, then it's kind of pointless. So what we can do is um, we need to get some data in, right? And being a JFocus, what else would I do than getting the, the JFocus data in? We also need, need, need a Neo4j database. Uh, fortunately, there's now a cloud service, so we can just spin up a database and it starts in two minutes and then I have a free database that I can use for, for the stuff. I call it JFocus. There are also code examples for, for different languages, including GraphQL. So if you want to get started directly, then this is pretty straightforward. Number one. Uh, the other thing that we need is, of course, some data. Uh, fortunately, I just looked at the JFocus website, opened a JavaScript console and a network tab, and nicely enough, there was a JSON endpoint, so I could just uh, uh, get the JSON data. So um, if you basically go to, to this page here, uh, you can just uh, look behind the scenes and you get this really nice uh, JSON endpoint that gets, gives you the JSON data for all the talks. You have these slots. Uh, you have, come on, uh, the speakers. And then down here, actually I can probably fold it just up. So we have slots, we have speakers, uh, when it was published and the presentations, and then, uh, yeah, that's all that we need, right? And you see, actually, uh, it's coming either from a relation database or from a JSON file or from a document store because kind of speakers are just IDs of the speakers in an array uh, as such. Um, so kind of hints at, hints, hints at that, right? So it's not a nested structure as such. So in GraphQL, this would be returned as a nested structure, for instance. So we have this JSON data, which is really cool. And, uh, whoops. Uh, I just clean out my database so that you know that I'm not cheating. And what we can do in, in Neo is basically, uh, we can fetch the data from the JSON uh, API. Actually, there's one more thing that I wanted to show you. Basically, what we want to look at, what, what, how would I represent this as a graph, right? So basically, I have the presentation in the middle. Everything is kind of tied to the presentation. Presentation is in a room. Oh, this should not say in room, it should say of type on the right side. So let's fix this. Uh, one second. No, that's the wrong one. Present. Uh, here, it should say of type. And type. Um, so, right, so basically it, it all centers around the presentation. We have the speaker who works at a company, a presentation is in a room and it's of a certain type, where the types are actually just keynote presentation and, and, and quickie or quick lightning talk. I would have loved if the data had something like topics because then you can correlate uh, presentations about topics and you can recommend, and recommend stuff. So we could do some NLP on the, the abstracts and extract topics and then add them to the model and then do some recommendations. But I haven't done this because this is more about GraphQL. So this is kind of our model. And if we now load the data into the database, it's basically we, we're fetching the JSON, we're creating our speakers, we're creating the companies, connect the speaker to the company uh, here. Uh, we create the presentations, we set attributes on the presentation, we connect the presentation to the speakers, and then we create a room if it doesn't exist, connect the presentation to the room, and create the type and connect the presentation to the type. So you see here, actually in this syntax, so Cypher is very much about ASCII art, so coming from multi-user dungeons and text adventures. I know they were really big in Sweden as well. At least uh, our company founder, Emil, was also an admin in a multi-user dungeon text adventure. Uh, so ASCII art is really cool. So in near 4 query language, there's a lot of ASCII art where you have round parentheses about entities or node, and then dash dash greater than as an arrow pointing as a relationship somewhere else. Right, so and if I run this, it fetches the data, adds the data uh, to the graph, 
And then if I run my query to show me all the data in my graph, I see here uh, the orange ones are the presentations, the, the brownish ones are the types. So I can also remove this type from the visualization so you see, you see it a little bit more like a graph. And so this is all of this is all of JFocus basically as a graph, all speakers, all rooms, all presentations as such, right? So that's our data. It's not a lot of data, but it's nice kind of to be meta and, and take this uh, information in. Okay, uh, and the next step is kind of building this GraphQL API that we've been talking about, right? So the graph database thing was just a detour uh, to get the data in. We could also, if we go schema first, so we write our GraphQL schema first, uh, we could use that and then with the mutations of GraphQL, just insert the data through GraphQL into, into the database. Right, that's the other direction that you can go. Okay, and what's really nice about a library and a tool is I can just click this button and it says generate type def, so it inspects the database and then uh, hopefully, yeah, uh, it inspects the database, so it just takes like a second or so, right? Um, inspects the database and generates the, the type definitions. And uh, they're already quite nice. The only thing that's kind of a little bit awkward is kind of the speakers works at. Uh, because you can have multiple nodes of, the, of different types on, on either sides of relationships. So you be, need to be verbose to not create duplicates, basically. If I only had works at, and if I didn't know, if I had a company, it could be like organization and company and something else, then I would have like multiple targets for works at. That's why it's here a little bit more verbose than it should be. But otherwise, it looks good. It has like the names, it has the IDs, it has the date time information already mapped correctly. So this is an a uh, custom scalar in GraphQL that you can uh, uh, that the library adds automatically. I have my relationships uh, with the annotations here, uh, with the directives here, so all the stuff is there. I just don't like these kind of verbose uh, words here, so that's why I created a short version where it's just a speakers or works at or something like that here. So I just steal this, this really quick and put this in. So it's basically the same, just with some names cleaned up. And, uh, okay, that's all my, my, my schema, and then I just say build schema, so it means it takes the schema and augments it, so it takes the schema and what does it do? It generates top-level queries, so for all my domain entities, it creates a query like speakers, uh, companies, presentations, uh, rooms, and so on, so entry points, and then for each of the types, it also generates the types, augments it with a little bit more information, for instance, like filtering. So you can now filter all the types with a filter-like syntax. So you can do like where conditions, you can limit, skip, sorting, and all the stuff on the GraphQL API. I didn't have to put this in myself. If I had to write resolvers myself, I would have to write a schema like this and implement all the stuff in my resolvers as well, which kind of sucks. Um, and so in this example here, uh, which is just kind of a quick example, is I query speakers, uh, that work at some company, and I don't know, we can, for instance, this was kind of Google, uh, but we can also say um, we want to have people that work at, I saw some people from Nasdaq coming over here yesterday. So is this already Nasdaq? Is this the Nasdaq person works at? Nasdaq, yeah. It updated the response so quickly that I couldn't see that actually. Um, so, and then, uh, as I said before, you get basically the structure back that you asked for, right? So this is a, actually a more involved query. We can do a simpler one. So for instance, if I just say query, actually to show you also how the autocomplete works, I just press control space or command space, and I can say, for instance, I want to see uh, speakers, and then I would say options uh, limit uh, five, and then I want to say, okay, for the speaker I want to have name a uh, Twitter handle, and then for the speaker, I uh, wanted to have the presents, the talk, with the title, and then uh, I want to also have the in-room, and I want to have the, I think, for whom it's ID, right? So I get type, uh, type completion for these. If my type definitions had documentation, so like comments above them, it would also show the comments here. There's also like a query builder where you can just click to get at this stuff as well. And then if I run this, um, then I get results. If I made a mistake and I would write something like ID2 here, it should actually complain about it uh, that it's not uh, valid. Actually, it should actually complain about it in the client. Uh, good question. So let's 
probably feedback from my, from my team that I should complain about it in the client. Um, and then you can also do much more complex uh, things as well on, on this side. You have, have multiple queries and so on. You also have mutations and, and all the other things. So kind of these top level entry points are auto generated. And then you can write your uh, GraphQL queries that you would then use in your mobile client or in your web app client or API clients to serve your business use cases, right? Um, so that's kind of just really, really quickly what this would, uh, would look like. And now I press Command C instead of Command V and I just need to steal uh, the query, the query again, where's speaker query, got this one. Um, so just not to lose this command V. And you see that I also in, in the nested fields, I can do something like I want to have only three presentations per type back or something like that, right? Or I can say for the type, I actually want to count how many presentations of that type existed, right? So for instance, of type presentations, there are 62 presentations, so it's does automatic aggregations in between as well. And uh, what the cool thing is uh, uh, as well, here with the schema definition, because I have enabled debug here, when I run these, uh, actually in the JavaScript console, it shows me the uh, GraphQL query, but also the Neo4j query that it generates, right? So if I, um, if I take this uh, Neo4j query here, uh, which is really small because the JavaScript console does not increase font if I increase font of the website. So if I just take this uh, Neo4j query and paste it into my uh, browser, uh, then it says it doesn't have the parameter that I have, which is my company name. So let's say uh, Microsoft or something like that. It's my parameter. And then I run the query again, and then I get basically get exactly the results back that you also saw in the, in the GraphQL API. So what we do is basically we transform the GraphQL query with, by using the type definitions into a Neo4j query, into only one, which is a tree query, which is easy for a graph database. We parameterize it so it's efficiently to, to, ex to execute, and then we run and return the results basically one-to-one -one back to the client uh, as such. Plus error handling in between and, 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 and things like that. So which is kind of nice. Uh, so basically, this is kind of on the slides for you later to have a look at this. Um, we've looked at all of these. Here's also the URL for the tool. So it's currently in preview. So if you want to try it out, I'd love to get feedback. Uh, so as you saw, we already found one bug, which is good. Uh, I found some more when testing it, but it's really early alpha beta uh, release. But that's kind of the nice thing about this tool. I didn't have to install Node. I didn't have to install Apollo Server. I didn't have to install uh, Apollo. Uh, GraphQL Playground, all the stuff. I didn't have to create a project, have Node and, and run it. Just for, for getting started with my, my, with my data as a GraphQL API, it's really nice to run this all in, in browser, actually, as such. Okay, the library, as I said, is basically uh, takes, um, sits between the GraphQL client and, and the database, and uh, the idea is to make life easier for GraphQL developers. It starts with schema first, so uh, some people in the GraphQL ecosystem go uh, basically programmatic schema, but we really like the SDL, so the, the, the type definition, because you can also put them into version control, you can migrate them, and, and so they are easy to understand, easy to, to read, even for people that are not developers. So from that perspective, I personally like the, the textual representation of the type definitions much more. There are a number of uh, projects in the GraphQL space who go, go with like DSLs for programmatic creation of type definitions as such. And then it can drive the database model, but also, as you saw, I can just click on generate type devs or call the infer schema thing in the library, and it generates the type definition, definitions for me, and then gives me a good starting point if I already have data in my database. And the library uh, does the following. It automatically generates query mutation types, top level for updating data. It also creates uh, subscriptions, which is currently in beta, which is really exciting because I've been waiting for that for a long time. And then all these stuff like ordering, pagination, filtering, complex uh, filters, uh, daytime aggregation, navigation, and authentication and, and permissions management as well. And this is basically all done by taking your schema that you created and enhancing and enriching it with lots of other meta information, additional fields on, on all your fields, uh, sorry, additional parameters on all your fields. So it becomes a much richer schema. So if you look at the schema in the GraphQL client, it's much more verbose and much more 
com comprehensive, basically, because it got augmented by the library, but you don't, don't ever have to deal with this augmented schema because that's just infrastructure schema, basically, for the tooling, so that all the type completion and all the checking and everything works as such. So it takes a GraphQL uh, query, uses the type system, generates the Neo4j query, which is efficient, and then basically executes this and uh, returns uh, the data. And the really nice thing, if you have ever, ever dealt with relation database and data loader and n plus one select problem, if you have deep GraphQL, GraphQL queries, which either require 25 joins or they require you to send 25 queries to the database to collect all this information, basically, and then aggregate stuff in between, for, because for data load, you have also aggregate and collect IDs in between, and I always found this very painful and not enjoyable. So as much as the user of the GraphQL APIs have a really good time, implementers of GraphQL APIs have not so much a good time, I think, at least. Uh, so I, we wanted to make this easier. Here's the example with the query. In, and as I said, you can either start schema first, where you develop your, or, so where you, you develop the schema, update and generate the data through the mutations of the GraphQL API, and then use it, or the other way around, you have already data inserted into your database, generate the schema from the graph, and then use the API as such. And uh, what's really uh, interesting there is because the graph database itself is schema-free, so it doesn't really care so much about what types, what fields, what relationship names, what type names exist there. Um, but the GraphQL schema really cares about this stuff. So you can basically use the schema to drive the database content and the other way around as well. So when you want to evolve your model in the database, you can just regenerate your um, type definitions or the other way around. When you start changing the schema from then on, you can migrate the data in the database and all future operations, read and write, will use the new schema as well, which is quite nice. So the evolution stuff is also handled uh, nicely. So and these are all the things that are kept in sync with the, with the schema as such. Mutations is a really interesting aspect because I mentioned before that I really like that GraphQL separates reads from writes. So like in command query separation, um, you have the read part and mutations in GraphQL are like commands in CQRS. So which are named like business operations say, hey, please, you know, change this address of a customer or something like that. Or please put this order into this specific cancellation state or something like that, which is kind of a command on the, on the business level. So that's what GraphQL can do. For us, because we're, we're dealing with a database, it's more like a CRUD or a COD API for mutation, so you can create update delete stuff. What's really nice, you can select what you want to update with conditions, and, and uh, so you can be really almost do like uh, real queries on the client. So I'm not a big fan of that, to be honest, because I would rather say, okay, here's the idea of the entity to update, please update this, and not like have complex conditions because you can shoot yourself really easily in the foot by messing up the conditions, and then you basically override your whole database with something that you actually not, didn't want to do. Uh, so I'm personally not so fond of these complex conditions for updates, but that's the way it is now. And uh, the uh, general, uh, the mutations are also configurable, so you can disable them for everything, for particular types. You can disable just uh, crates and deletes and keep updates. You can authenticate uh, people. You can do only the owner can update their stuff and, and, and so on. So you have a lot of control on the, on the mutations as well, how you want to do them. Here's an example. You can just basically run an update mutation, update speakers, you pass in. Um, what to update, and then where, basically, is the conditional uh, where you said what do I want to update. Or you can also create data uh, where and connect data at the same time. So for instance, here I create an entry for Alina, who's awesome, and I pass in the, like, the attributes that are required, because GraphQL type definitions also can say this is a nullable or non-nullable field, so it uses that as well for for the mutations to say is this a required field or not required field. And then I actually can connect it directly to existing nodes, or if the node does, or the entity doesn't exist, it can also conditionally create that dependent entity as well, right? And this can go really complex, and you can imagine, which is kind of cool for a demo, but it's harder for production code to maintain. So one level deep connections is what I would recommend folks to use, because otherwise you, um, I mean, it looks cool, but then it, your mental model becomes really difficult uh, to handle that. Uh, one thing that's really nice about uh, GraphQL mutations is, unlike other uh, APIs and, and query languages, 
what you do, you do the update, and then at the same mutation, you can also return data at the same time. So you don't have to read my own writes problem because you don't have the post to an endpoint to update something, read from an endpoint, oh, this endpoint is pointing to another eventual consistent part of my data system. So my reads are actually something else that has not yet been updated and takes you know, 50 or 100 or 200 or 500 milliseconds for the update to arrive actually there. In GraphQL, you actually pass in not just the update, but also the stuff that you want to get back. So you basically have the ability uh, to immediately, uh, for instance, if you have a new UI, you send the update, you get the results back, and then you can update the UI in one go without doing multiple round trips, which is a really cool feature as well. Unfortunately, Neo4j's query language supports this as well, combining reads and writes in the same query, so it's, it was pretty straightforward. How are you doing time? It's okay. Um, so um, you can extend those with, uh, with uh, directives and adding just uh, on the schema graph queries. So for instance, if I want to add a recommendation to something, I just do a one-liner to get a recommendation on my presentation. Because I didn't have content uh, topics, I just did which presentations are at the same time, basically. I just, as this presentation, so I can see what's overlapping and what kind of conflicts might I have. But that's an easy way to extend this stuff just on a schema level. But you can also do custom resolvers. So you can also implement your own resolvers and then delegate after you do pre or post stuff on, on your resolver, then you can just delegate to the uh, library or you can do whatever you want in the resolver, of course, as well, uh, accessing other APIs and, and so on. Subscriptions is uh, currently in beta. It's basically a live query where you get updates whenever the underlying data changes. So whenever something is updated through mutations, the subscriptions gets you an, an endless stream of updates of these kind of things where you subscribe. So for people that want to uh, um, implement you know, chats or notification streams or stuff like that, then you can use subscriptions as such. And, but this needs more on the, on the server side uh, because you need then a WebSocket server to stream the updates in and then be there. So we covered like the two parts here. Um, authorization uh, doesn't work inside the browser because all the auth libraries and JWT libraries only exist for Node, not for the browser. You can't run this stuff in a browser uh, demo. Uh, so you basically have to build your own projects, which is kind of just adding uh, the GraphQL, the driver, and Apollo together. And then basically you have your GraphQL type definition. You create a new for your driver, create a library, pass this Apollo server, and then you're done. And then that serves your GraphQL API. And then you can basically um, connect it, start the, start the backend API, and then you connect, connect it to, an, uh, to a browser. And then you can basically run on your locally running um, GraphQL API. You can run uh, GraphQL Playground here, for instance. Right? So this enabled GraphQL Playground, and so you can run GraphQL playground on the stuff that runs on my machine here as well. So this is the stuff that you would have to do to actually get a project going. And something I said to my folks that built the uh, uh, UI is they should actually have an option to download a project with all the package JSON and everything so that you don't need to do anything, but it gets it all automatically. So uh, for us, it uses JWT, JWT tokens, which can contain both and principal as well as roles as well, and have managed all the expiry and everything. So you just pass your JWT token as an authorization header. Uh, so this is JWTIO for debugging JWT tokens. It's really cool, uh, easy to use, and you can check whatever is wrong with your thing. And you have uh, basically the sub is the, uh, the, the principal, and then you can have additional roles. And with these um, directives, you can secure complete types, individual fields, you can uh, secure reads or writes, things like that. So the, the, the easiest thing is something like it's authenticated, so only for logged in users this field is available or this object type is readable. If a not logged in user accesses the API, uh, they will get an error. Um, the next thing is you can add to each field and each type more complex things. So you can allow or disallow reads, writes, updates for either roles in the JWT token or actually, you can uh, take the, the user credential or the principal and bind this to a nested type. So for instance, if an, a presentation is uh, presented by a, a, an, um, an speaker, and the speaker has his, uh, their sub basically in the JWT token uh, that is the same as the speaker login on the, uh, on the, on the JFocus system, uh, then you can uh, basically take the thing from the JWT token sub, 
it will be automatically merged into the query that would do the update or so. And if it doesn't match, uh, then you get an error or nothing happens because the match is not there. And uh, the, this auth directive is super powerful. So bind is only one option that you can do. You can also do uh, things like allow. So then it would um, verify that you have access to the data when you read data. And if you don't have access, then it errors, uh, which I don't really like so much because then kind of it just generates a lot of errors. What I really like much more is the where option there because that kind of integrates your uh, user information as a conditional and then the, you, you can just say give me all data x and the library actually adds the conditional only where this user has is kind of like the, the author or the contributor or the committer or whatever and uh, so you basically tell the system to show you everything but what it actually uses is it's only their stuff basically but you don't need to hand code this for every user and every in every type and resolver yourself, but the, the library basically adds this. Uh, and you can specify this because you have the type system again. You can specify this as the type system, uh, basically nested tree of conditionals, which is pretty pretty cool, yeah, as well. So there's a lot of stuff possible on the auth side. Um, it goes way deeper than what I can show here. It's like lots of documentation uh, for, for the auth. I'm personally also not a big fan of security topics uh, because they're really complicated and over my head oftentimes, so I leave it to the experts that actually know what they're doing because I would probably <laughs> just mess it up. So there's a lot of stuff there and it's, it's really impressive what the, what the team built in as well. The last bit is optimization uh, because uh, I mentioned that you know, GraphQL queries are really easy to use, but they're also really easy to misuse, right? Imagine you're exposing whatever backend system you have over GraphQL. The user can do whatever shape and depth and complexity of query that they want, right? So that means also they can mess up really badly, right? They can pull your whole database into memory or your whole backend system can bring it to a standstill. If you ever use the GitHub GraphQL APIs, you know that they have a lot of limits and filters and you have to do like cursor-based pagination, you have to add limits, you have to have that throttling in, in included as well. So it's very kind of narrowed down. Twitter, for instance, uses GraphQL APIs, but they don't allow any freeform GraphQL queries, they always only use pre-compiled GraphQL queries. So they basically, the development teams have to pre-submit their GraphQL queries. They are kind of verified, pre-compiled, and then you get a GraphQL query ID token back for your team. And that's what you're allowed to use with against the internal uh, Twitter GraphQL APIs. Because then they can make sure these are optimized, they can kind of ensure that it's caching, and also can manage better like migrations as well. Right? So that's very kind of narrowed down as such. So from that perspective, you have to watch out. It's a lot of power, but it's also a lot of power, right? So it's, you have to watch out what you want to do there. And optimizing uh, GraphQL queries is um, really sometimes a challenge because you don't want to limit the power that the users have, but you also don't want to give them the ability to, to break and kill your system as well. And what's nice of having a database that ha is kind of such a good match to the, the shape of the GraphQL uh, APIs is basically that you can exactly transform the GraphQL query into one single graph query, and that actually only fetches and touches the data that the user actually wants. So I don't need to pull in like 25 joins to pull in data, just I follow exactly these relationships of this root entity that I'm selecting, and so it fetches only the data that I, that I really need. And it also allows for like nested paginations and nested cursors, like six, six level deep, uh, which I wouldn't even know how to do this in, in SQL properly as such without either tons of sub-queries or tons of multi-requests, basically. The multi-request is the other aspect um, that I already mentioned. Because GraphQL queries are tree queries, it's something that uh, graph databases do really well. And if you ever tried recursive queries in SQL, who's done recursive queries with comment table expressions? One, two, three, four. So you know it's uh, not as easy as it uh, is made sound. And I think there's like one Stack Overflow post that explains how to do recursive CTEs with, with Postgres. And then everyone goes there and copies the code and then hope it runs for me. And um, so it's, uh, it's much more complex to get it right. So the, the default solution is do n plus one queries. So every level gets like one SQL query with fetching all the um, IDs that are needed for that. And there's a tool called Data Loader that's usually used for that. So there's a lot of infrastructure complexity basically behind it. It seems to allow the power for the user. And um, that's where the graph is, is doing quite well. 
and then a performance because the, the database is optimized for these kinds of queries. Performance is uh, really nice, and you can also do costing because the database has also ability to run profile and explain on these statements, so the library can use that to actually generate cost predictions for the GraphQL queries as well. So you can use this to use actually uh, to limit and throttle user queries. So if they used up their quota of database interactions, that's something that the library can automatically add as well. And you don't have the impedance message of the mental model of the, of the storage and how the GraphQL uh, ecosystem thinks about stuff. So I think uh, that was quite nice uh, that we could solve all these things in a, in a good way. Uh, and with that, I'm open for questions. If you want to learn more about this, there's a Manning book. Uh, it's almost done. My colleague has been working on it for quite some time, uh, but it's almost done. He's now doing the last technical review, and it will be published really soon. So if you go to the site, you get like the first few chapters, but then you also get an email with the full PDF book uh, as well. So can recommend that uh, if you want to, to have a look. Um, otherwise, uh, we also have it at the uh, booth if you don't scan the QR code. And if you want to look at the lib, uh, you can go to dev.nivitcom slash graphqllib, which takes you to the uh, library page with all the docs and examples and GitHub repository and, and so on. What's actually nice about the GraphQL library is it's very developed in the open, lots of community contributions, lots of feedback, super active on Discord as well. So it's also something where you really see there's a lot of interest, a lot of engagement, and the, and the devs in the, in the team are really excited and, and engaged as well. They love that so many people are using it, provide so much feedback, like bug fixes are done within a day or two. It's pretty cool. So I'm really, really excited about this library. Cool, and that's it for me. Any questions, feedback, comment uh, from anyone? I know that this was a lot of content, but I hope you at least get, get an understanding what's there, what you can use. And uh, if you want to build it yourself, all the stuff is open source, both the Java or the Kotlin implementation as well as the JavaScript implementation. You can also just sneak in and look at how it's done and uh, use uh, all the insights yourself uh, if you ever need to do something like that yourself. But are there any questions? Otherwise, enjoy lunch and have a good rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you.